Anamnesis is a concept appearing in Plato's Socratic Dialogues, Meno and Phaedo. It is the idea that humans possess knowledge from past incarnations, and that all learning truly consists only in remembering. Infamous early 20th century British magician, Aleister Crowley, taught of two methods to attain what he called the magical memory, essentially a nearly photographic memory like his own. The first of these methods he references in Lieber 913 as having been detailed in Bhikkhu Ananda Mattia's Training of the Mind, Equinox, Volume 1, Book 5, pages 28 to 59, and especially pages 48 to 56. We have little to alter or to add. In Chapter 69 of his autobiography, Confessions, Crowley adds as a footnote about Lieber 913, the first method is to learn to think backwards till he acquires the power of recalling the events of his life in reverse chronological order. The idea is to get back beyond one's birth to one's previous death, and so on for many lives. It should then be easy to understand the general object of one's existence. Describing the process of analyzing one's own possible past life regressions, Crowley advocated strenuous practice of this method. In Lieber 913, having allowed the mind to return for some hundred times to the hour of birth, it should be encouraged to endeavor to penetrate beyond that period. If it be properly trained to run backwards, there will be little difficulty in doing this, although it is one of the distinct steps in the practice. The second of these methods involves using meditation techniques, described in Lieber 9, to attain a mental condition in which, in Lieber 913, Old memories arise unbidden. The adept may then practice this, stopping at that stage and encouraging instead of suppressing the flashes of memory. Of this second method, Crowley adds in his footnote from Confessions, chapter 69, the second, easier and surer method is to consider every event in one's past, determine the influence which each has had upon one's life, and by synthesizing these forces, calculate their resultant, that is, determine one's general direction, so as to be able to concentrate one's energies on fulfilling the function for which one is fit. Character, conduct, and circumstances are to be considered as terms of a complex dynamic equation. This method is of extreme value to all. It should be applied even to the education of children so as not to force them into unnatural developments. Czech psychiatrist Stan Groff, born July 1st, 1931, premises a cartography of the psyche, mapping experiences of both a mundane and transmundane nature into a single holotropic model. Roth pioneered research with psychedelics and discovered that ancient pranayama yogic breathing techniques can induce deep unconscious and superconscious levels of the human psyche to surface, 
similarly to chemical reactions of psychedelic substances, an effect possibly attributable to release of endogenous DMT, serotonin, endorphins, etc., that result from both methods. According to Groff's findings following decades of research, he plotted a chart first describing a pair of barriers that keep people's minds from slipping into such a peak experiential condition whenever confronted with unspecific sensory experiences, i.e. vague memory triggers. The first of these two barriers is the sensory barrier we acquire to dull and block out sensory overload. This sensory barrier determines which unspecific sensory experiences will serve as effective memory triggers toward the next psychological barrier and which will not. The second of these psychological barriers, Groff calls the recollective biographical barrier, wherein one's self-awareness, personality, and unresolved emotional issues become more active considerations. In-depth psychotherapy, such as under hypnosis, also, but to a much greater degree when under the influence of pranayama breathwork or psychedelic chemicals, one may begin to relive long-buried traumas, sometimes accompanied by dramatic physiological manifestations. Groff calls these flashback experiences, which when recovered often bring back a large amount of associated fantasy material along with relevant memories, co-exes, an abbreviation for biographically formative condensed experiences. While traumatic events all have different causes and later unspecific sensory memory triggers, the manner human organisms react to them appears to stem ubiquitously from the stress and trauma one first experiences in life during their own birth. According to Groff, when one confronts their own birth trauma, one attains a form of ego death and ultimately apotheosis. Groff categorizes the earliest phases for the development of consciousness in a modern human individual into four perinatal phases or basic perinatal matrices, BPMs, thus. BPM 1, the amniotic universe. The sensation of a fetus in utero, suspended in amnionic fluid inside the womb, connected to an indirectly perceived maternal organism via only an umbilical cord. Besides the argument of when does life begin, there remains the likely assertion that it is not at birth but at some point prior to the experience of actually being born. Thus, the very first imprint made on an individual is that while they are still inside the uterus, and these sensations include a feeling of relative weightlessness and an all-pervasive unity and oneness with an infinitely limitless environment, extending beyond them by an unknown and ineffable amount and experience directly solely as heat and occasional changes to the vague, ambient light that appears to emanate from all around. BPM 2 Cosmic Engulfment with No Exit With the onset of labor in the maternal organism, the sleep of the unborn baby begins to become disturbed. With the start of muscular purgative contractions and the breaking of the water, 
when the fluid medium in which the fetus had been floating is suddenly and violently evacuated from around it. The unborn child begins being turned upside down inside its now empty chamber as it is prepared to be ejected out through the female's genitalia. Anyone caught in a cyclical pattern wherein they relive a condition of daily melancholia is, to that extent, caught reliving this event in their initial experience of the birth trauma. Feelings of loneliness, helplessness, abandonment, and claustrophobia may surface in someone undergoing a trauma comparable to this magnitude. BPM 3 The Death Rebirth Struggle According to Groff, as the fetus is passed through the narrow birth canal, it experiences its first act of trauma. This trauma is, first and foremost, physical and painful. However, it is also emotionally painful, as well as causing trauma that can be recognized even up to a spiritual level of human self-expression. The conflict between self and otherness is experienced at its most basic life or death level as the struggle for survival itself by a child during birth and this introduces the birthing baby's brain to a host of new chemical reactions including the triggering of their endocrine and immune systems. The result is usually an overwhelming experience of pain mixed with pleasure, despair combined with hope, and the first near-death experience coupled with a feeling of disassociatively ecstatic neural overload. BPM 4 The Death Rebirth Experience The fourth basic perinatal matrix begins with an infant's crowning when its fontanelle begins to breach the birth canal. As the newborn is expelled into the real world, its initial experiences physically are of a drastic change to pressure and to temperature, both decreased immensely from that to which they had become accustomed. Coupled with the severing of the umbilical cord, this sudden change to pressure and temperature has the effect on the newborn's brain of sparking its autoimmune system into initial action. Feelings of aloneness and simultaneous triumph, essentially allowing a psychological acceptance and apotheosis to occur following the event, are the final phase in individual experiences before opening their eyes to the reality of their new environment. Harvard University clinical psychologist Tim Leary, 1920 until 1996. Following the Harvard Psilocybin Project from 1960 until 1962, went on to advocate use of psychedelics in clinical treatment of psychological disorders and proposed a model for the human mind that was, in part, inspired by his close exposure to early modern psychedelic use. Leary's psychological construct, later also elaborated on largely by American novelist Robert Anton Wilson, 1932 until 2007, was dubbed the Eight Circuits of Consciousness. The earlier, or larval, for circuits to become active were, tentatively, associated with the left hemisphere of the cerebrum, at the time associated with deductive reasoning and logic, while the later four are mostly yet dormant and inert, so far unemerged and so forth, thought to be found in the right hemisphere, then thought to be more inductive and intuitive. These eight circuits identified by Leary 
with revisions to their titles by Wilson, were 1. The Vegetative Invertebrate Circuit, or the Oral Biosurvival Circuit, 2. The Emotional Locomotion Circuit, the Anal Territorial Circuit, 3. The Laryngeal Manual Symbolic Circuit, the semantic time bending circuit. 4. The sociosexual domestication circuit. The sociosexual circuit. 5. The neurosomatic circuit. 6. The neuroelectric circuit. The metaprogramming circuit. 7. The neurogenetic circuit. The morphogenetic circuit. 8. The neuroatomic metaphysiological, the non local quantum circuit. 1. The vegetative invertebrate circuit, the oral biosurvival circuit. This circuit is said to have appeared in the earliest evolution of the invertebrate brain and corresponds to the reptilian brain of triune brain theory. The circuit operates in essentially the same way across mammals, reptiles, fish, primates, and humans. This circuit is concerned with nourishment, physical safety, comfort and survival, suckling, cuddling, etc. It begins with one spatial dimension, forward or back. This circuit is imprinted early in infancy. The imprint will normally last for life unless it is re-imprinted by a powerful experience. Depending on the nature of the imprint, the organism will tend towards one of two basic attitudes. A positive imprint sets up a basic attitude of trust. The organism generally considers the environment benign and accepts and approaches. A negative imprint sets up a basic attitude of suspicion. The organism generally regards the environment as hostile and flees and avoids. Robert Anton Wilson equated this circuit with the oral stage in the Freudian theory of psychosexual development and proposed that this circuit is activated in adults by strong opioids. 2. The emotional locomotion circuit, the anal territorial circuit. This circuit appeared first in territorial vertebrate animals and is preserved across all mammals. It corresponds to the mammalian brain of triune brain theory. The emotional territorial circuit is imprinted in the toddler stage. It is concerned with domination and submission, territoriality, etc. This circuit introduces a second spatial dimension up or down. The imprint on this circuit will trigger one of two states. 1. Dominant aggressive behavior. This imprint creates an alpha social attitude or 2. Submissive cooperative behavior equivalent to Nietzschean slave morality. Robert Anton Wilson equated this circuit with the anal stage in the Freudian theory of psychosexual development. The circuit is activated by depressant drugs such as alcohol, barbiturates, and benzodiazepines. 3. The laryngeal manual symbolic circuit. The semantic time bending circuit. This circuit supposedly appeared first when hominids started differentiating from the rest of the primates. It is concerned with language, handling the environment, invention, calculation, prediction, building a mental map of the universe, physical dexterity, etc. This circuit is imprinted by human symbol systems. Robert Anton Wilson 
being heavily influenced by general semantics, writes of this circuit as the time-binding circuit. This means that this circuit's contents, including human know-how, technology, science, etc., are preserved mimetically and passed on from generation to generation, constantly mutating and increasing in sophistication. Four, the sociosexual domestication circuit. The sociosexual circuit. This circuit is said to have first appeared with the development of tribes. The fourth circuit concerns itself with cultural values and operating within social networks. It is concerned with sexual pleasure instead of sexual reproduction. Local definitions of moral and immoral, reproduction, rearing of the young, etc. This fourth circuit is imprinted by the first orgasm mating experiences and tribal morals. Some have pointed out that entactogens, such as MDMA, seem to meet some of the requirements needed to activate this circuit. 5. The Neurosomatic Circuit Leary describes that this circuit first appeared in the upper classes with the development of leisure class civilizations around 2000 BC. The fifth circuit is consciousness of the body. When this circuit is activated, a non-conceptual feeling of well-being arises. This has a beneficial effect on the health of the physical body. There is a marked shift from linear, visual space to an all-encompassing, aesthetic, sensory space. Perceptions are judged not so much for their meaning and utility, but for their aesthetic qualities. Experience of this circuit often accompanies a hedonistic turn-on, a rapturous amusement, a detachment from the previously compulsive mechanism of the first four circuits. This is concerned with neurological somatic feedbacks, feeling high and blissful, somatic reprogramming, etc. It may be called the rapture circuit. This circuit is activated by ecstatic experiences via physiological effects of cannabis, hatha yoga, tantra, and zen meditation. Robert Anton Wilson writes, Tantra yoga is concerned with shifting consciousness entirely into this circuit and that prolonged sexual play without orgasm always triggers some circuit 5 consciousness. 6. The Neuroelectric Circuit The Metaprogramming Circuit This circuit is traced by Leary back to 500 BC the sixth circuit consists of the nervous system becoming aware of itself. This circuit is concerned with re-imprinting and reprogramming all earlier circuits and the relativity of realities perceived. Leary says this circuit enables telepathic communication and is activated by low to moderate doses of LSD. Moderate doses of peyote psilocybin mushrooms, and meditation or chanting, especially when used in a group or ritual setting. 7. The Neurogenetic Circuit The Morphogenetic Circuit The circuit first appeared among the Hindus in the early first millennium and later reappeared among the Sufi sects. Activation of this circuit may be equated with consciousness of the great god Pan in his aspect as life as a whole, or with consciousness of Gaia 
the biosphere considered as a single organism. Those who achieve this mutation may speak of past lives, reincarnation, immortality, etc. It corresponds to the collective unconscious in the models of Carl Jung, where archetypes reside. This circuit is the connection of the individual's mind to the whole sweep of evolution and life as a whole. It is the part of consciousness that echoes the experiences of the previous generations that have brought the individual's brain-mind to its present level. It deals with ancestral, societal, and scientific DNA, RNA, brain feedbacks. This circuit is activated by moderate doses of LSD, higher doses of peyote, higher doses of psilocybin mushrooms, yoga, and meditation. 8. The neuroatomic, metaphysiological, the non-local, quantum circuit. This circuit has been compared to the Buddhist concept of Indra's net from the Avatam Saka Sutra. The Eighth Circuit is concerned with quantum consciousness, non-local awareness, information from beyond ordinary space-time awareness, which is limited by the speed of light, and illumination. Some of the ways this circuit can get activated are the awakening of Kundalini, shock, a near-death experience, DMT, etc. The liberation through hearing during the intermediate state or the Tibetan Book of the Dead was composed in the 8th century by Padmasambhava written down by his primary student Yeshe Tsogol buried in the Gampo Hills in central Tibet and subsequently discovered by a Tibetan Tertan, Karma Lengpa, in the 14th century. It lists in two separate sections the supplication of the Bardo of Dharmata, including the Bardo of Dying, followed by the supplication pointing out the Bardo of Existence, the bardo of existence and preparation for death. Thus, in the first book of the bardo total, on the Dharmata bardo, experienced between one body's death and one's next rebirth, three phases are experienced by a being's mental state. One, Chikai bardo, or Bardo of the Moment of Death features the experience of the clear light of reality, or at least the nearest approximation of which one is spiritually capable of perceiving. 2. The Chonyed Bardo, or Bardo of the Experiencing of Reality features the experience of visions of various Buddha forms or the nearest approximations of which one is capable of perceiving. And three, the Siddha Bardo, or Bardo of Rebirth, which features karmically impelled hallucinations, typically Yabyum, image of men and women passionately entwined. In the second treatise of the Bardo Thodal, on the existence Bardo, experienced between one body's birth and that body's death, three phases are listed, corresponding to the three experienced following their bodily mortality in the prior work, 
although being more commonly experienced in our daily lives as animate, self-aware human beings. These three phases of mind perceiving existence while alive are 1. Life, our ordinary waking state, roughly correspondent to beta brain waves. 2. Dhyana, the mind state achieved in meditative trance, roughly equivalent to alpha brain waves. And 3. Dream, deep, restful sleep, roughly alike theta brain waves. The later Pali tradition of the six domains in the desire realm managed to remain consistent to the apparently originally Tibetan source work, although the remainder of Buddhism did not. In Taoism and Theravada Buddhism, there are only five such realms, because the domain of the Asuras is not regarded as separate from that of the Nagas. In the Tibetan and later Pali traditions, the desire realm, with its six domains, exists between the form realm and the formless realm. In the Pali arrangement, it is clear how this form realm, the desire realm, and the formless realm may form the Triloka, although it may also be understood that while the dream bardo of the Tibetan Book of the Dead touches upon and borders with the form realm, likewise does Chikai bardo with the formless realm that is called the clear light of reality. In his own translation as the psychedelic experience, Timothy Leary describes seven bardos corresponding the uppermost to ego death and dissolution into Chikai Bardo itself. The six domains of the desire realm are 1. The God, Angel, Sanskrit and Pali, Deva, Domain. 2. The Jealous God, or Titan, Sanskrit and Pali Asura, Domain. 3. The Human, Sanskrit, Manusya, Pali, Manusa, Domain. 4. The Animal, Sanskrit, Tariyag, Yani, Pali, Tarachan, Ayani, Domain. 5. The Hungry Ghost, Sanskrit, Preta, Pali, Peta, Domain. 6. The Hell, Sanskrit, Naraka, Pali, Niraya, Domain. The seven second bardo visions classified by Leary are 1. The source or creator vision 2. The internal flow of archetypal processes 3. The fire flow of internal continuity 4. The wave vibration structure of external forms 5. The vibratory waves of external unity. 6. The retinal circus. And 7. The magic theater. Even as there are three bardos of existence between life and death, and so three bardos of the Dharmata, 
between death and life. Just so, there are three categories of suffering, coupled to the three precious and life-sustaining jewels of Buddhism. Just as there are the three phases of dream, of meditation, and of waking life within the bardo of existence, so too are there the three phases of the Chikhai, Chon Yid, and Sid Pop Bardos in chronological descent, respectively, for the Bardo of the Dharmata. And just as there are both of these, so too there are the three categories of suffering that correspond equally and opposite to the three jewels of Buddhism. These three categories of suffering, Sanskrit, Dukkha, are 1. The physical and mental suffering associated with aging, illness, and death. 2. The anxiety and stress of trying to grasp solidity in an ever-changing mostly empty reality. And three, the deep, all-pervasive knowledge that every act is futile and that nothing ideal can be sustained. Just so, these three jewels of Buddhism are one, the Buddha, two, the Dharma, the teachings of Buddha, and three, the Sangha, the community of contemporary enlightened. Just so, it was that once the Buddha, by then called Conqueror, Blessed One, and Gone, but not yet called Gone Beyond, was, as it is described in the Samyuktagama, 379, turning the Dharma wheel. At the Deer Park in Isipatana, near Baranasi, with the five bhikkhus, including Gondana, where he sat and expounded his Dharma. Thus, he described five types of pain and, to the last type, he attended two further attributes. One, the pain of birth. Two, aging. Three, illness. Four, death. And five, unfair luck, described as undue karma, and qualified as being both a union with the undesired, and b. division from the desired. The Buddha then further expounded upon his discovery of a middle way between the two extremes of 1. sensual pleasure, or 2. self-mortification. According to the Buddha, again, confer the turning of the Dharma wheel document. This middle way gives rise to vision, vision gives rise to knowledge, and knowledge in turn leads to 1. Peace 2. Direct knowledge 3. Enlightenment and 4. Nibbana He then extolled the points upon the Eightfold path as such. 1. Right view. 2. Right intention. 3. Right speech. 4. Right action. 5. Right livelihood. 6. Right effort. Karma. 7. Right mindfulness. Aim. And 8. Right concentration, focus. 
the Buddha then explained that this eightfold path or middle way as he had laid it out leads one to the Four Noble Truths. These Four Noble Truths are 1. The Truth of Suffering Pain 2. The Truth of The Cause of Pain 3. The Truth of The End of Pain and 4. The Truth of Avoiding Pain the truth of suffering pain is that all conditional phenomena and experiences are ultimately unsatisfying. The truth of the cause of pain is that craving for and clinging to what is pleasurable and aversion to what is unpleasant result in becoming, rebirth, dissatisfaction, and death. The truth of the end of pain is that if one ends craving and clinging, one will also bring about an end to becoming, rebirth, etc. The truth of avoiding pain is that by following the eightfold path, behaving decently, cultivating discipline, and practicing mindfulness, and meditation. One may put an end to craving and clinging, and thus to becoming, rebirth, dissatisfaction, and death.